Hey everyone, welcome to the next part of the Earth Science Final Review Master Overview Series. This is going to be part two. If you missed part one, check out the link in the description. I will link part one. And this part is going to start at astronomy. So I just want to remind you that the whole series is available uh, for specific videos that go into more depth about this material. So this video in particular is a general overview of what you should know for the final. This is not going to be explaining everything step by step like I did in this series. So I will also link this series in the description below. So if you see something during today's video that you are weak on, go find that video in this playlist and you can learn exactly what you need to know. All right, so here we go. We're gonna start with astronomy today, a huge unit. So we'll see how long this goes and we'll see how many more parts there's gonna to be to these uh, final review series. So here we go, we're gonna start with what you need to know about the universe. You have to know that it's everything that exists and it's about 10 billion years old, specifically 13.7. So you could get a question that asks you about the range of age of the universe and you would wanna pick like anywhere from 10 to 15 billion, ideally. Big Bang Theory was the point at which everything began, so it's the universe started and started expanding 13.7 billion years ago from an infinitely small point um, of high density and temperature. We got some evidence that we need to know how do we know the Big Bang happened. There's a few pieces of evidence that we know. The first one is cosmic microwave background radiation that we can detect. We also know the temperature of cosmic microwave background is very, very cold. It's extremely close to absolute zero, but not quite absolute zero. We have a light year. It's the distance that light can travel in one year, and this is going to lead us into our second piece of evidence. We have galaxies that we detected with the Hubble Space Telescope a while ago. There's about 100,000... There's about a hundred billion stars in one galaxy, and there's like a hundred billion galaxies. So galaxies are generally shaped as you see on the screen. Our galaxy is the Milky Way. We are a spiral galaxy. You have to know that. Right there, it's like the shape of a pinwheel, essentially. We have a wavelength. This is going to come up in a second for when we talk about redshift. So the wavelength is the distance from the first crest of a wave to the second crest of the wave. And as it becomes shorter wavelength like this, the wave is essentially more powerful. So like an X-ray might look like that, while radio wave might look like longer wavelength. There's a bigger distance between these two points here. Red light has a long wavelength and blue light has a short wavelength. So essentially with redshift and blue shift, we say if it's redshifting, the object's moving away from you, and if it's blue shifting, the object's moving towards you. You have to know how to read this wavelength chart on page 14. It just tells you the wavelength in order from longest here to shortest over here. So make sure you know how to read it. We have absorption lines. You should know how to read absorption spectra. So you look at the normal one or the lab one, which is in this case here. If you were to compare it to this one here, you could see that the absorption lines move to the right, which is more red. So this is a red shift. And up here, this one moved to the left. So it's going to be blue shifting. If it's red shifting, that object's moving away. So 99% of the time, it's going to be a red shift. And that's proof that the universe is expanding evidence number two. The further away the object is, the greater the redshift is, which means that the universe is expanding faster and faster the further away you go. We have constellations in the sky. Your constellations in the sky are going to change depending on the season. So that's going to be impacted by the revolution of the Earth around the sun. You have to know that constellation, visible constellations are changed by the Earth revolving. In terms of stars, the bigger mass the star is, the shorter it's going to live. So the smaller stars live longer than the bigger stars. We have nuclear fusion. Inside of a star, nuclear fusion occurs. This is when hydrogen, which is a low mass element, so hydrogen plus another hydrogen gives you helium. And it also produces light and heat. So low mass elements add together give you a bigger element of helium, lighter into heavier. You have to know how to read the star 
chart here on page 15 HR diagram you should know everything about this so I'm not gonna go into this in this video if you want to learn this chart go check out the stars uh, video in the playlist below we have our life cycle of a star you should be familiar with this just know that the bigger the star is the higher the chance it's gonna go supernova and turn into these neutron stars and black holes our sun is going to go down this path here to a red giant to a planetary nebula nebula and then to the white dwarf all right going into some solar system stuff we had the geocentric model at first this is when the earth was in the center and all the planets traveled in circular orbits we have the modern heliocentric model. This is right now. So we have the sun in the middle. That's what heliocentric means. And all the planets travel in elliptical orbits, which are sort of like ovals, so they're not perfect circles. The Earth rotates. This is turning, like you see in this video, uh, the animation right here. We turn counterclockwise, so west to east. This is going to give us day and night, and it's also going to make everything move through the sky, like the sun, the moon, and the stars. Then we have the Earth revolution. This is going to be when the one object moves around the other object, and this is going to give us our seasons, and like we said before, it's going to cause the constellations in the sky to change. The closer the planet is to the sun, the shorter it takes to go around it. It's a shorter path. So the further it is away, the longer it takes to go around the sun. So this is called period of revolution, how long it takes to revolve. The sun is composed of hydrogen and helium. You should know that. The sun produces sunspots. These are cyclic events that happen about every 10 to 11 years. Just know that sunspots exist and that the activity is cyclic. So we could predict most likely when there's going to be a lot of them. Then we got our planets in the solar system. We have our four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. They are small. They don't have that many moons. They're solid. We have our asteroid belt. That's going to separate the terrestrial planets from the Jovian planets. You should know the asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter. You should also know what they look like. So if you see this as a picture, you should be able to tell that that's an asteroid. We have a Jovian planet slide here. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. These are our four gas giants. Some facts about them. They're really, really big. They're made of gas. They have low densities and they have a lot of moons. There's also a comet. This is a small body of rock, iron, and water that is orbiting the sun. And as it gets close to the sun, it produces this tail and the tail always points away from the sun. You should definitely know how to read this chart on page 15. So if you want to pause this and look at my little notes that I made, you can. But again, I'm not sitting here and explaining this chart. If you need to know how to read this chart, go find the solar system video in my specific playlist. All right, we got Kepler. His first law, just that every planet travels in an ellipse around the star with the sun at one of the two foci. So there's two focus points and the star that the planet's orbiting is one of them. Eccentricity, it's how close or far away from a perfect circle the orbit is. The closer the number is to zero, the more circular it is. The closer it is to 1.0, the more ovally it is. So the solar system planets are pretty circular, but there's none that are zero. That's the point, that's what Kepler discovered. There's no perfect circular orbits. Here's the formula to solve for eccentricity. It's on the reference table, so you don't have to remember that. Distance between the focus points is here, and the L value is from here to here, the diameter of the whole orbit. We have aphelion and perihelion. Aphelion starts with an A. It's the point where the planet's furthest away from the sun. If it's furthest away from the sun, it's experiencing the least amount of gravitational pull, which means it's going to travel slowly. And perihelion is when it's going to be closest to the sun, which means it's experiencing the most gravitational pull, which means it's going to go really, really fast. So here's your three laws. The first law is the eccentricity with the ellipses. The second one is 
planets speed up and slow down as they get close to the sun and they slow down as they get further away. And the third law is the further away from the sun the planet is, the longer it takes to go around the sun and the slower it is. All right, the Earth rotates. We know this because of a foe called pendulum. It is a swinging weight and it moves clockwise and knocks over pegs as the experiment. We also have the Coriolis effect. The fact that the winds curve in the northern hemisphere, they curve to the right and the southern hemisphere, they curve to the left. This proves that the Earth rotates. How do we know the Earth revolves? Well, we said the seasons change. We see different constellations. We revolve counterclockwise around the sun, just like we rotate counterclockwise. And it's about one degree per day because we go 360 degrees around the sun and it takes 365 days in a year. So this is one degree per day, right? As opposed to the rate of rotation, which we talked about earlier, that's 360 degrees spinning in 24 hours. That ends up being 15 degrees every hour. So don't get those confused. All right, reasons for the seasons. We have the Earth's tilt. The Earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees. You have to remember that number. During the summer, we're tilted towards the sun. During the winter, we're tilted away from the sun. Angle of insulation is going to change based on the tilt. When we are tilted towards the sun, the angle of insulation increases. The sun is more directly overhead. That's what brings the heat. It has nothing to do with the distance between the sun and the earth. So if it's indirect sun, meaning we're tilted away from the, earth, the sun, your um, sunlight is going to be less of an angle. So this one over here is tilted away, and this one over here is tilted towards. That, that's how the seasons happen. Reason number two, parallelism. The tilt always stays in the same direction, so the Earth's not wobbling. And then reason number three, the Earth's revolution changes the position of the tilt, like this. So tilt stays in the same direction, we revolve, and that gives you the seasons. Now, you have to know all the facts about the seasons. So June 21st, longest duration of insulation, we're tilted towards the sun, we have the longest path in the sky. You should know 15 hours a day, 9 hours a night. We need to know the sunrise in June is northeast, and the sun's direct rays are hitting the Tropic of Cancer. You're literally just going to have to remember this. So you might have to make flashcards. We also have the shortest shadows because the sun is highest in the sky. So this is what New York State's celestial sphere diagram looks. You're going to have to know celestial sphere diagrams. So again, if you forgot this, go check out my video on spheres. Uh, winter solstice, December 21st, shortest duration of insulation. It's, this is going to be all the opposite of summer. So I'm not going to sit here and read all this. I will show you, remember, December trick rises in the southeast. You spell December wrong. And know where your direct ray is, Tropic of Capricorn. We got our equinoxes, that's March 21st and September 23rd. Equal day and night, 12 hours and 12 hours everywhere. Like North Pole, Equator, South Pole, everywhere. Sunrise exactly east, sets exactly west, and our direct ray is on the equator. You should know what the zenith is. It's the point directly above the observer's head. Solar noon is when the sun is at its highest point in the sky. It does not have to be 12 p.m., okay? It's just whatever time the sun's at the highest point. In the northern hemisphere, you always have to look south to see the sun at solar noon. So this is specifically at solar noon. The sun will always be south. And in the southern hemisphere, you have to look north. The Between seasons, the sun's height is going to change by 23 and a half degrees because that's the tilt of the earth. Okay, I'm just going to flash through some sphere diagrams that you shouldn't be familiar with. This is 42 degrees north. This one here is 42 degrees south, so it's just flipped the other way. This one's 23 and a half degrees north. This one's the equator. This one's the North Pole. All directions are south. This one's the South Pole, all directions are north. 
those are really easy to remember and here I'm just gonna scroll down so you could see my answer for the diagram on the right I thought this might be helpful for you just to see March 21st at the equator I'm just gonna scroll you should definitely be familiar with these again if you are lost on these you should go watch my video on how these work all right all right the moon is gonna be the last part of astronomy here the moon takes 27.3 days to revolve and rotate so we always see the same side of the moon the moon rises 50 minutes later every single day there are craters on the moon because the moon does not have an atmosphere a moon phase cycle takes 29.5 days. You have to memorize this number. It's not on the reference table. You should know the moon phases. I'm not going to sit here and teach you the moon phases. Go check out my moon video if you want to learn them. But you should be able to look at this diagram and know that this spot here is a waxing crescent. And so on and so forth. You should be able to just rattle them off. Remember, they could put the sunlight on the other side, in which case it would mirror this the opposite way. So you got to be careful where the sun is coming in. Tides. So there's going to be two high tides and two low tides per day. They're based off of gravitational pull. They're about six hours and 13 minutes apart, and they're cyclic and predictable. If you have the sun, moon, and the earth lined up, that's going to give you spring tides, which is a higher high tide and a lower low tide. You got neap tides, which is going to be first quarter and third quarter right here. This is going to give you low high tides and high low tides. We got our eclipses. You should just be aware that the, the eclipses don't happen every month because the moon's orbit is slightly tilted, so it does not work every month. You should know the geometry of both eclipses. So what a lunar eclipse is, sun, earth, moon, like this, the moon's in the earth's shadow. And then you should know solar eclipse is going to be when the moon blocks out the sun. All right, I think that was a good enough length of video so next part is going to be energy and weather but this astronomy unit was gigantic so we're going to stop here on part two stay tuned for part three i hope this is helpful and good luck in your studies leave a comment below if you have a question and good luck talk to you later